Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you may happen to be, and whether you're looking at the live or the archived version, and welcome to another Nautel Tech or Transmission Talk Tuesday. I'll never get that name right, but hey, you never know. If we keep doing this, maybe I will. I'm Jeff Welton. I'm happy to be with you this afternoon, and I've got uh, a great guest today. We're going to have a little bit of fun, as always. Uh, we're talking about a slightly different topic. We're not going to be into the nuts and bolts of the transmitters as much today. We're going to talk a little bit more about HD radio and how we could potentially start seeing some ROI and creating a revenue stream with it. So with that note or in that in mind, I've got uh, Rick Greenhut from Exbury with me today. And uh, Rick, welcome and glad to have you aboard. Thank you. Glad to be aboard. Now, one thing I've got to notice before we go any further, uh, I mentioned this earlier, but uh, I, I saw the airplane plane propeller that you'd restored on the wall behind you, and you're a little bit of a pilot, correct? A little bit of a pilot, yes, since uh, since high school, back right yeah. after the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I, I mean, I'm not saying that Rick's old, but I think the Wright brothers took their lessons from him. Anyway, uh, Marco made it a good nice. point. Marco, Marco says that we can change the name of the webinars, so marketing people just pay, take note that I, I may arbitrarily uh, rename this as uh, something else just to make it easier for me to remember. Uh, our topic today, as I said, is HD as a revenue stream. Before we get into it, uh, the standard uh, preface about um, housekeeping, your uh, the chat tab, and Marco's already used it. I see a few other people have already um, identified the, uh, the questions notes. Uh, Amber, I'm not sure about the audio. There is an audio tab in the dashboard. If you're not able to get it to work, this will be archived and you will be able to view it later as well. Um, Ed, if you're in the background, maybe you could drop a text note to Amber and the questions about that. Uh, so by all means, ask the questions. If you raise your hand at any point, there is the little hand wavy icon and I see it, I'll uh, be able to unmute and if your microphone's working, then we can chat real time as well. Remember that uh, completing a Nautel webinar does qualify for half a SBE recertification credit under category I. Uh, I see uh, or saw Wayne Piscina, our SBE president was with us earlier. I hope he's still with us. So, hey Wayne, welcome aboard. On that note, let's get rolling. So HD radio, um, it's one of these things that uh, you know, listeners have always connected to radio. And uh, so I'm gonna let Rick talk to this a little bit, but I, I do have to mention the uh, the push button receiver. Does anybody still remember pushing or pulling the knobs out to get the presets set? Uh, anyway, uh, Rick, if you could address this, tell me a little bit about this. Well, first of all, I'm glad you noticed that because that was that was for the, the oldsters among us. That's uh, an AM only Motorola radio where you you did pull the buttons out to set them. Um, radio is has been such a part of everyone's life that people tend to take it for granted. Um, the example I always like to use is back when I was uh, a senior in high school in 1969. According to Arbitron, 95% of the U.S. population 12 plus listened to radio. 50 years later, in last year in June, that number had dropped to 92%, according to Nielsen. So in 50 years, 3% attrition, despite the fact that so many things have changed in our media world. You know, there was no, there was no cable TV, there was no uh, satellite radio, there was no streaming, we didn't have cell phones. And yet with the advent of all that stuff, Radio is still something people listen to, especially in their cars. And that's kind of why I, I put together this montage, because it just underscores the fact that people are involved with the medium like few other things in their lives. Right, exactly. It's just one of those things where you get a connection that you don't tend to get nearly as much with almost any other kind of thing where, where folks tend to be talking at you and not to you, so to speak. A radio station does things that your streaming service never did. Um, someone once said that a streaming service never threw you a t-shirt in the stands during a concert. And a streaming service never played your request. And a streaming service wasn't there for you telling you about what was happening in your local community. Nothing beats live radio. 
true enough for sure. So clicking through this a little bit, and there have been, and, and I told somebody recently that it wasn't a matter of their, uh, uh, of the competition for the years. There's always been competition, but the intricacies have, is, have evolved a little bit, if I'm not mistaken. Now, when you stop and think about what's changed and how our challenges have gone from the biggest problem a radio station general manager had in the in the 50s and 60s was the competing stations and new ways of bringing audio into the car. And then at the end of that period, the beginning of satellite radio, that was just like playing checkers. And then you move on to suddenly playing chess, where you've got all these portable players and smartphones, and then you've got cloud-based streaming. And the next thing you know, you're playing 3D chess with Mr. Spock on the bridge of the Enterprise, because you've got all these things that no one ever thought of a few years ago that are now vying for consumers' attention. Right, exactly. And it say the, the number of years hasn't changed, and we're going to address this in a little bit because there you did make a really interesting point when we were talking before we started. And uh, I'll hit that when we get to that slide, but uh, but this is just keep this in the back of your mind. Um, the cool thing about it is, and, and here's where we touch this, even though there are a lot more choices, it doesn't mean that we've got fewer potential listening hours or fewer listeners. And, and what was your point with that? Well, simply this, unlike TV and print where, you know, newspapers are burning the furniture to keep warm because their business model didn't take into account the other ways of getting their product. So it's always been a zero sum game for them. Unlike TV and print though, radio listening isn't like that. More audio choices doesn't mean that the same amount of listening gets divvied up into thinner and thinner slices of the pie. More audio choices means more audio usage because you can do radio while you're doing other things. You can't watch TV and drive. But you can drive and listen. Well, yeah, maybe you can, but <laughs> the rest of us try not to do unsafe things like that. The new uh, audio sources simply mean consumers now spend more time with audio than they did before. And there's endless studies from Nielsen and from Edison Research and from all kinds of other research firms, including Numeris in Canada, that basically shows new audio sources mean longer listening, not the same amount of listening split, spread among more choices. Well, and that comes back to your point earlier where radio listening has dropped from a whopping 95% to uh, 92%. Right, barely less than barely a change relatively speaking. So that that's a good point and it, it's something to keep in the back of your mind is that we can add new choices. We're not divvying up the same pie. We're making the pie a little bigger at the same time. But that comes back to the um the features and what do you add with HD radio to actually make it worth people going to the expo? Well, and I mean, some of it's just attrition. I bought a new truck last June and it's got an HD receiver in it. Uh, I don't have an HD station within 500 miles of here, so we'll have to talk offline about that, but that's a whole different story. Um, so the features, talk to those a little bit if you could. Well, first and foremost, um, our BDS is kind of a, a, a sore point in the U.S. among manufacturers because when this standard came up, the manufacturers naturally assume broadcasters were going to all start doing it. The hardware is very inexpensive. The ability to do it is part of your existing playout system. And yet only about 55 or 60 percent of the stations in the U.S. are even doing our BDS, which is interesting when you stop and think that every other audio source that people are used to comes with metadata. HD radio provides a lot more metadata than our BDS. If you think you're just in the audio business, then you're still playing checkers. Additional channels and additional metadata mean you can keep people for longer listening periods or spread them among your brands. 
which is the whole purpose behind HD radio. The digital sound pro provides that digital sound quality that really r brings broadcast radio on a par with what they're already used to in streaming. A lot of this, unfortunately, is radio playing catch up. Radio providing metadata like the streaming services, radio providing more narrowly focused targeted channels like the streaming service, radio providing digital sound like the streaming services. This is not something that listeners don't want. This is something listeners are already used to from the other audio sources they listen to in their car or homes. And of course, beyond those, oh, I'm just, Sorry, I had to unmute myself. I'm sitting here talking and nothing's happening. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't be right if I didn't have at least one technical snafu. But uh, the one thing I am going to qualify, this digital sound one caught my ear, or well, my ear and my eye, because uh, one of the biggest gripes you get about HD is the sound quality. And I've heard good HD and I've heard bad HD. And this comes back to, and we'll touch on this later as well, but it comes back to you can't treat this like the like the the redheaded stepchild, so to speak, that you just throw on and ignore. You do have to treat it properly. It's got to be acted on like real radio. Well, and that's an important piece of it too, because you will hear problems in your broadcasting plant in digital you didn't hear in analog, and, and it. It, it quite simply, there are quality issues there that you might already have that your listeners are going to be more aware of. And that goes back to the old days when we were replacing AM tube rigs with, uh, I had one guy call me once and he, he growled. He says, I bought this new transmitter of yours. And I said, okay, is something wrong with it? And he goes, no. I go, why are you angry at me? And he goes, because now I've got to do $30,000 worth of work in the studio because I can hear every hiss, hum, and pop that there ever was that I didn't know about before. So that, that was sort big, of thing. Back in the day, that was one of the big gripes with, with FM. When people started using their FMs instead of just simulcasting them with their AMs, they discovered that the quality of what was leaving the studio was a lot more apparent to the listener. And, and that really brings to the, to the next point, artist experience. The ability to have images to go along with your music, your jock talking, a uh, specific program like NPR does a great job with, with this, having images that are related to the stories they're hearing. And not incidentally, images that happen to be the advertiser's logo when a commercial is playing. It's the first time radio has been able to create a visual call to action. And that ties in nicely with emergency alerts. There are table radios that have HD capability that will wake up for emergency alerts. Your shut off radio will turn on when there's an emergency alert in the same way that your cell phone will carry those government alerts. And of course, the ability to show images and text features, all that metadata, all the artist experience images, that ties into emergency alerts as well. So this, this was always envisioned as what radio had to evolve to, to maintain competition with all the other media that were on the horizon at the turn of the last century. Right. Now, the cool thing is, and I mean, with the geocoding as an example, I mean, most, of course, most Sage Index or whatever work by county code when they send an alert. So you'll get an alert over here, but not over there, for example. Exactly. And some of the things we've been playing with have been uh, like single frequency networking or even one central feed driving multiple stations where they get the EAS data back from that station, incorporated into their importer stream to feed out to the HD signals for that station, all done from a knock several hundred miles away. Right. Um, on that, uh, Eric had asked a question, and I'm gonna throw it out here. It's uh, sort of tangentially related, but this is the cool thing about the uh, transmission talk Tuesdays is we can wander all over the spectrum. Um, we're talking about making our AM fully digital. Does our NX10 need any modifications? We'd still need an experimental license. So, Eric, to answer that, and, and I'll be doing a MA3 presentation for the St. Louis and Kansas City SBE chapters tomorrow, then another one next week for the Texas and Oklahoma chapters. 
But uh, the short answer is the transmitter itself won't need modifications. You will need the external HD generator. And MA3 is still considered experimental, so you will need to, uh, to file an STA application for it. I, I got that right, Rick? That's correct. Um, in addition, right now, Xperia is still offering MA3 HD radio licenses at no charge, and that's no charge in perpetuity. Um, that will continue for some indefinite time through the summer at least. It's kind now, of tied what to is the, the pandemic. What, what is the de facto license fee for an MA or for a HDAM? For an HDAM that's going to operate in MA1 mode, it's seventy five hundred dollars. That's spread over six years with two thousand dollars down. Then I think it comes to six hundred dollars a year for the five following years. So. All, all of the prices are structured, so there's a payout over time with no interest. So the stations are already making money with the technology as they're in the process of paying it off. But for stations going from analog directly to MA3, because they already have a translator or they already have a built-in audience, then at that point, there is no charge for the license. Excellent. And Ed's in the background pinging me to make me a, a point that uh, by all means, if you don't feel like typing out a question, you can certainly hit the hand raise button and I'm happy to open the mic and we could go just about anywhere with this. And uh, unlike most radio shows, we're not doing a whole lot of pre-production scanning. So uh, be nice <laughs> to me, if not to Rick, you know. <laughs> so uh, now this gets us to the core point and I'm going to throw out a few things and this is the part where we really require input from the listeners. I mean, y'all are the ones that live radio every day. We build it and uh, Rick uh, comes up with technological ideas and fancy stuff like that. But, uh, but you folks are the ones that make radio work on a, on a regular basis. So this is the one where we want you guys thinking about what could you be doing to make money with something like this. And I'll give you some ideas, and I know Rick has got several too from folks that we've heard who are actually able to make this run. And one of the cool things is um, what you can do with it. So Rick, I'm gonna get you to address this slide if you would, and uh, we, we'll carry on for a bit. Happy to. Um, one of the things is why share audience with your competition when you can share it with yourself? Um, as one of my customers said, I don't care which of my stations they listen to, it's all going into the same pocket. And in his case, that was his pocket. So rather than tune out, the average individual listens to something like 2.3 radio stations. What if two of yours channels are part of that 2.3? Instead of tune out, get them to tune over. And this goes back to programming. Um, a broad appeal country station may have an HD2 that is traditional old time country. They may have an HD3 that's country slash hip hop. You know, there may be ways to slice and dice your existing audience. And a piece of it is to do an audience study, find out who you're sharing audience with and where they're going and whether or not you could produce something on one of your multicast channels that'll keep them from leaving your brand and going to someone else. It's additional channels, three of them, that you can market. It means you can keep your existing listeners for longer periods, and if you promote it correctly, like a real radio station, you're gonna generate new listenership from a new audience. You can keep your occasional listeners for longer, maybe turn them into P1s, and really, really target what's going on. Uh, other stations use it as training wheels to fine tune a new format that they might be trying in another market or that might be going on one of their other stations in the market. But the bottom line here is the crass commercial part of me. It's the opportunity to make more money. This isn't a science project. I've been in sales for 50 years and I'm not advocating converting because it's a technically sweet challenge. I'm advocating converting because it's the future of radio and it's a way a station can make more dollars with more channels and more programming to serve more people. Or even in the case of public radio, add more features. And I'll give you an example. Uh, one of my customers and a, and a good friend 
in uh, in the upper Midwest, they run a uh, university radio station, and one of their HD channels is 100% student programming. It is literally the training wheels station. So their their whole goal is to let the students loose on this HD channel, and they're actually got the format on it tweaked to the point now where it frequently shows up in the ratings at or near the local country station. So you got this little HD with a, I think they may have a translator on it now, although they didn't have then. But uh, it, when they first started showing up in the ratings, it was just the uh, just the HD station alone. And uh, they're, they're uh, beating out this 100 kilowatt C3 playing a different format because it just happens to be something the students are programming to themselves. It's it's all about the content. And, and it, it, I like to think it gives you a chance as a as a radio station operator to have your cake and eat it too. You've got your main channel, your cash cow, that's where all your revenue comes in today. But you light up a channel like this, um, and all of a sudden you've got more for non-com, you've got more donation possibilities. Student run radio stations have a lot of cachet with certain local donors that want to support their local community. So there's right. a whole way that that can pay for itself. And it's obvious how an HD2 that attracts a new audience is going to attract new advertisers as well. Absolutely. I mean, I've got a couple of customers running ethnic programming on HD2s in markets where that, that uh, particular culture is just totally underserved. One of my uh, favorite examples is actually in uh, in Toronto. There's a station that basically broadcast a hodgepodge of different languages because they only had one channel. So if you mm -hmm. wanted to listen to Farsi, you need to listen between three and five on Tuesday afternoons. Well, they went HD and they were able to commit whole channels to different languages. And they're all South Asian languages. So if you speak Tagalog or a Punjabi, there's a channel for you. And that also means for the radio station, there's an advertiser for them. They can walk in the door in that local area in Toronto where that particular ethnic group lives and say, our listeners speak your language. We speak your language. In fact, it's the only place on the radio dial you can advertise to people who might not be terribly conversant in English yet. Mm -hmm. That's a really compelling sale. I'm sure it is. Oh, I got a couple of technical ones here because we do Tech 2. Tech, yep. Well, like I said, I want to call it Tech Talk Tuesdays. That's uh, probably what it's going to be called informally, no matter what the marketing guys say. Um, and uh, one of them is, is anything being done to address audio dropout for HD2 or higher channels that don't blend to an FM analog? And, and Randall, I can, I can hit that because I wrote a paper about it for the uh, BEITC at NAB in 2018. The biggest challenge, and I'll, I'll quantify this because it's obviously not the case all the time, but the biggest challenge tends to be folks who adopted early built to minus 20 dB and didn't have the headroom to go further, or they're in a high level combined situation or a channel combiner where they just physically can't go any higher because of uh, limitations in the combining network. Um, minus 20 dB in all honesty is not going to give you a city grade coverage. Um, Rick's nodding his head, so I haven't yep. insulted haven't insulted him yet. Uh, minus 14 dB, which is pretty much the standard now, will give you solid coverage out to the 60 dBU and reasonable out to the 54. So it's a pretty good city grade contour in most cases. Some terrain will vary from others. And if you're in a place where you can get to minus 10, there will be a lot of situations where the HD actually goes further than the analog. Now, the reason the HD2s tend to drop out faster, and, and you'll notice that HT2 and 3 react a little differently. It's because of where the carriers are located in the bandwidth relative to the, uh, relative to the fundamental frequency. So they do drop out at slightly different points. You may have the analogs or the HD1 still locked in, not shifting to analog when your HD2 starts to drop out. And you'll find your HD3 tends to last a little longer. It, it's just, it's kind of weird. But uh, that's the basic uh, theory behind that. So as a rule, that's what you're looking at. It's a, a station that isn't running to the peak of capability in a lot of cases because they just physically can't.
at this point. And, and you know what? I'm, I'm so glad you made that point because oftentimes I'll talk to somebody who lives on the fringe of a major market saying, I can't get their HD2 and their, their main channel blasts in here. And it turns out to have been one of those early adopters. They didn't build the headroom into their system and they're operating at minus 20. So they have building penetration problems. They have coverage problems. Um, and people think, well, that's an HD radio problem. And in reality, it's just an early adopter issue. We've all been on the bleeding edge of technology and a radio station isn't gonna go and replace a five-year-old transmitter because they didn't build enough headroom in until it's time. And we understand that. Now, now see, as you get older, time goes faster and you just proved that because the early adopters were 15 years ago already. Well, that's believe it or not, <laughs> while, while that's true, while that's true, believe it or not, we have people who bought transmitters five and seven years ago mm -hmm. who still went to minus 20 and said, well, that's fine for starters, even though I've everyone run, recommended against it. I've run into that where, and, and this is something we'll, we'll talk about them as a solution later on, but translators, folks building just to drive a translator and building the bare minimum and that's almost always come back to, to not be the best idea. Now, this, um, this would actually, this applies in a way to HD as well. Um, Cipriano asked why if you're using DRM and digital AM, the power is lower compared to if you're using analog medium wave radio. And the only reason I bring it up in an HD conversation is because we made a similar comment to the FCC during the MPRM for MA3 that when you're running all digital, your carrier power away from the fundamental, you've got so much power in the sidebands that your aggregate total power is several dB above what you actually think you're running in analog. So if I had a five kilowatt transmitter and I flipped it over to MA3 and left the power setting exactly the same, I'd probably light up the ATUs and they'd all burn up because the aggregate channel power is so much higher. So at Cipriano, that's the reason for the lower power when you're running all digital is because your channel power is actually significantly higher. It's also part of the reason that the uh, all digital signal will tend to outperform the analog even at a lower power level. So that's a that's a good MA3 question. I like the MA3 questions. This is <laughs> this is a fun technology. Um, another one from Bob Trimble. Hey Bob, how you doing? Bob's uh, uh, one of our reps out in the West Coast. Bob wants to know what the licensing fees are for the small non-common tribal. So a non-commercial uh, FM license fee, what, what's that running these days? Um, it's always been capped at $5,000. Um, there's some caveats there. If, if it's an NPR station that's ever been a grant recipient, there may be a prepaid license waiting for them. They can contact the people at CPB who prepaid for a block of HD licenses back in 2002. And there are still a number of those licenses on the books. So a public radio station that's been a grant recipient at some point can just get the folks at CPB to let Xperia know that CPB considers them qualified, we can give them a free license. Um, for tribal and small market stations, um, all the HD radio rates are not based on market size. Um, because of the agreement to do reasonable and non-discriminatory pricing, each category is, is the same across market size. So a non-commercial station pays $5,000. That too can be spread over six years, $2,000 down, and then um, you know the remainder over time. And um, then the multicast channel fees are half that of commercial stations. Right. Oh. And Jake in North Dakota, hey Jake, how you doing? Um, he asks, what's your roadmap to get HD radio installed stock in more vehicles? Um, uh, now here's the funny thing. He mentions Ford comes to mind as not offering HD unless you buy a higher end vehicle. But when we were doing the all digital testing in 2015, MPR Labs specifically recommended we rented Fords because the odds of finding one with an HD receiver in it were higher. Maybe that's because the rental car companies use the higher end vehicles. I don't know. I know well, my 
2018 Silverado has an HD receiver stock from the factory, but but beyond that, how, what do you do? Uh, it's it's we've we've had a staff of 15 people in Detroit since 2000, basically carrying the water for radio. These folks had never at the auto companies had never seen anybody from the radio industry before HD radio started talking to them. Um, right now, half the cars delivered in America come with a factory installed HD radio. All 41 brands, from Tesla right down to, to Kia, they all have at least one model that has HD radio. Um, the issue happens to be the entry level cars, not the fleet cars you get from, from the, the rental car companies, but the stock basic bare bones entry level car typically does not have HD radio. Now that's changing too since the mandate to have backup cameras meant one of the most expensive part of those radios was the display. And now that there's got to be a display anyhow, the cost of the manufacturer is not as great. But Ford certainly have it as options. Um, Lincoln's, I've got a Lincoln with an HD radio. Uh, once again, it's not going to be the entry level model in some cases. Other manufacturers, have HD radio standard across their whole line. You buy a BMW, you can't get a car without HD radio. Uh, and the funny thing is, like I say, my uh, Silverado uh, has an HD receiver stock, but uh, I never think of a pickup truck as a high-end vehicle, but these days it's getting there pretty fast. Well, when you looked at the sticker price, I think you realized yeah. it was a high-end vehicle. And, and my wife's Chevy Spark does not have HD, but uh, but yeah, price-wise, that's uh, that, that's definitely the case. Um, now, here's another, and this is more a uh, future design question on HD itself. Um, in future, is there any plan to uh, to use uh, different codecs like XHE AAC or uh, Dolby AC4, uh, or they, are they sticking with the codec they've got? For right now, we're sticking with the codec we've got. I mean, what what happens in the future? You know, everything's on the table and everything gets looked at on a regular basis, but there are no there are no active plans to change the codec. And, and I mean, to be brutally honest, this codec, if you're processing lightly and not uh, compressing or throwing too many sample rate conversions at it it's it's not a bad codec i mean it's clean down to 36 kilobits easily and at 24 i've heard classical music on 24 with only minor artifacting now i'll grant it my ears are not the best i don't qualify as an audiophile so i've got friends that know a lot more than me when it comes to listening for what sounds good well for the av the average listener a lot of a lot of people, especially younger people, tend to ignore the artifacts because their world has been digital and their world that's digital is filled with artifacts. So Indeed. what what older people find offensive becomes transparent to them. Um, one of the biggest issues with quality, at least in the U.S., has to do with the number of major market stations that are still using Voltaire's and other boosters for PPM. Um, ironically, HD radio technology slightly boosts the ability of the PPM devices to pick up the watermark. Um, it's a three to five percent increase, but you know you'll take it. But a lot of people have their Voltaire's cranked up to 11. Their stations don't sound great, but it's got nothing to do with HD. It's got to do with getting every single one of those watermarks decoded. Right. And I mean, ultimately, what it comes down to, and this, uh, and you were talking about the young folks and the artifacts. Uh, so my older boy burned me a CD mixtape once for a truck several vintages ago, and uh, I plugged it in. I listened to the first maybe 30 seconds of the first song, and I took it off and took it out and handed it back and said, thanks, I appreciate it. It was an awesome gesture, but I can't listen to this. And he goes, why? And it was all 128K MP3. So I took him back to the house and I fired up the Zenith and I put some Beethoven on and put a set of headphones on him and made him listen to some classical music off an LP, scratches and all for, you know, about half an hour. And then I sat him back out in the truck and plugged the CD player in. He didn't make it 20 seconds. Just that little bit of break and having his ears retrained made all the difference. But the point I was getting at growing up 50 years ago, 
we had one radio in the kitchen. It was an old clock, alarm clock radio that sat on top of the refrigerator right beside the milk separating machine. And that was the radio in our house. And that was the one my father listened to his entire life, pretty much. So I want to hear more the about the milk, milk separating machine, though. Yeah, yeah that, we'll take that one offline. But, uh, <laughs> but point being that sound quality has not really been an issue to the average. And there's our problem. And you mentioned it earlier. We use different metrics when we're judging than the people listening. They're just listening to hear if they're, we're playing something they want to hear. Yeah, that's the that's the bottom line. You know, 99 listeners out of 100 don't hear the artifacts that make engineers gnash their teeth and pull out the soldering soldering iron to work on something. Let's see. And Brett asks, "What's your opinion on the progress in Porter software being able to run on system not requiring an OS licensing model?" Um, embedded so. Uh, I, I guess the theory is whether, like importers running Linux, for example, as opposed to Windows. And do you have an opinion on that? I mean, as long as it works, who cares? Yeah, really, no opinion on it. Was like you said, as long as it works, who cares? Now, the one caveat, and we're the, I think, I don't know if we're the only holdout, but we're one of them. We still use Windows for our importers, but we use it because we're not building a purpose-driven machine. So we're not limited. We can build all the computer hardware we need to and we can use because there aren't a lot of drivers and you have a lot less control over a Linux-based system. So if you upgrade a sound card, for example, you're at the mercy of whether or not you can find a driver for it. Whereas with a Windows system, typically if you upgrade a sound card, you're going to find a Windows driver for it. Uh, the other advantage we've got with that configuration is, in our case, we're able to drive the processor at about 10% capability. Uh, we did a demonstration back the end of April for our virtual nug, and it's been on the air since New Hampshire Public Radio is running five importers in one box, just yeah. separate in installations and software. So, uh, so you've got a lot more flexibility in a non-embedded solution. But an embedded solution, if what you want to do is put on an HD system with these channels, it'll do the job just fine, whether it's Linux or Windows. Now, let's see. Oh, and the other thing, the Windows ones that are used are mostly LTSC, so the uh, updates are not as much an issue as you would get in a conventional. So opportunity to make money, and I did put your, uh, your marketing director sales guy type uh, graphic in there um, because who doesn't like to see stacks of cash? Right. But uh, this is where we sum it up. And I mean, this is not the last slide by a long shot, but this is where we sum it up quite nicely. It's not putting it in because it's the shiny new thing. If you don't have a service or a product to provide that people want to hear, you're probably not going to generate a lot of revenue with it, at which point you just wasted a bunch of money. I couldn't agree I couldn't agree more. The the bottom line here is it's technology that allows you to generate revenue. It's not technology for technology's sake. Um your there's 15 years of this commercialized so you're not on the bleeding edge of technology. We're on the fourth generation of equipment. The fifth generation is on the drawing board. Uh, the cost of entry has come down by almost 70% from the first days of HD radio. So it's all about making money and everybody is happy to spend a little money if you can make a little money. But what you can't do is decide to go HD and sit back and wait for somebody to suggest what to do with those channels and wait for somebody to knock on your door and say, I'd like to advertise there. It's all about being proactive. And th the bottom line to all of this is the civilians out there, the listeners, they don't differentiate between a translator or a multicast signal. All they know is there's a new radio station and they like to listen to it and they patronize those advertisers. It's all about giving the consumer what they want when they want it. 
So four grins, around about 2008, 2009, be about 10 years ago, I was in St. Cloud, Minnesota, and we were doing an Ampers, uh, the Association of Minnesota Public Engineering Stations. Um, and uh, so we, a public and educational radio station, sorry to any Ampers members that were listening, I got that wrong. Um, anyway, so we, at the time, we put KVSC in St. Cloud, we, uh, Plug your ears, Rick. We turned HD on. May may not have been licensed, but I think there's a statute of limitations. It's off now, and actually they're licensed now. Yes, but, they are. Uh, anyway, we did do a a test run of it as part of this demo. So we turned HD on for HD on for three days. Put programs on in HD one, two, and three. They received a bucket load of phone calls in the first 24 hours, saying, "Oh, you've got HD. That's awesome." The people knew about it. They didn't think anybody, they didn't even think there was a receiver in their market. And this was 10 years ago. And things have only improved since then. Now, Aaron Hume makes a comment too, that on the importer side of things out in Seattle, oh, that's uh, that's a uh, 40 kilowatt. I remember that one. Hey, Aaron. Um, they're running a stereo tool on their HD multicast to process their HD two and three. So that's another advantage of having a, a bigger flexible computer for this stuff is that you can play a lot more with that stuff. Um, but again, that it's, it's a tool. It comes back to what you want to accomplish and how you want to make it happen. So definitely that's up to you. The big thing is you can come up with the best content ever, the shiniest thing, get the new gear, plug it in, turn it on. If you don't tell anybody it's there, nobody's going to listen. And I, this is something I hear all the time from, from general managers. They say, well, we, we put this new hip hop format on the air and we didn't show up in Nielsen and nobody knows about it. And typically while I'm talking to them on the phone, I go to their website, there's nothing on the website. I said, did you advertise? Did you cross promote on your main channel? Did you do bumper stickers or t-shirts or hat? Well, no, we, we couldn't afford any of that well you spend money to make money and at some point there are low cost ways to promote your radio station and then the, typically the next thing they say was well you know i don't know if there's enough receivers in this market right now in the u.s 22 percent of all the cars on the road have an hd radio receiver that's one car in five in markets like new york miami san francisco detroit west palm beach even burlington vermont it's over 33% penetration. New York is pushing 40%. So you're talking about one car in three or better in major markets that have HD radio receivers. Now you're never gonna get everybody in the car listening, but if you get the right people aware of your right, correct format, if you're providing content that they want and you let them know where it is, they're not gonna differentiate between your HD2 on a translator in analog, your HD2 in native HD, all they know is there's a new station and I like it. Right. Now, I see we've got a couple of hands raised, so I'm going to try the unmuting thing. Uh, we'll start with uh, Richard Kunkel. Richard, I've clicked unmute. Uh, give me a mic check and see if you're there. Uh, can you hear me? We hear you loud and clear. Awesome. So what's your question? Okay. Well, I, I just, I'm a general manager uh, from the past. I uh, haven't been for about five or six years, but I remember it, uh, at our public radio station, which was a Class C, which went on the air in 1980, you know, eventually um, it became, we wanted to do more program services, and it became pretty difficult to um, come up with additional high-powered stations in our market uh, to reach out way out into the boonies like our our, our original station did. Um, but we did go on the air with uh, a class A and a class B, but of course that never reached way out into the distant uh, uh, hills that uh, our original station did. And, and people way out in these small towns started saying, well, you know, we'd like to hear your, your smaller stations. One was an all news and one was radio remix. And, and uh, so what we did was we put the signals from our smaller stations uh, on HD channels and managed to get it out into 
the distant markets and feed our translators out there. So now all of a sudden, all three of our services are available anywhere we have translators. It works real well for us. Now we're a public rate, we were a public radio station. Um, so the way that might convert into money, of course, would be additional donations, um, underwriting, things like that. But it worked right. no. quite well for us, and we were doing that, oh, let's see, we probably started doing that eight or nine years ago, mm-hmm. something like something like that. HD's been kind of fun. We've had, um, uh, well, with three stations, each station had the other stations on on the HD channels, but the purpose was to get the signal way out and, and match the penetration that we got on our high-powered station. It's worked right. for us. Yep, and I've had several, and, and we'll see a slide like that, but uh, that's exactly one of the points. It's a good way, and I know, uh, and I, I'll pick uh, pick one group, uh, one of the bigger groups uh, for a long while, and I don't know if they still do, because, well, obviously, I haven't been on the road for several months, but uh, it's starting to show with my hair, too. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh one of the things we've noticed is uh, one of the big groups used to play a niche format, a, a Mississippi Delta Blues on their HD2, and I loved hearing that in any market I could go to because it's not something you hear on a on a traditional station. So, mm-hmm. Richard, thank thank you very very much for that input. I really appreciate that. Uh, I've also got uh, Philippe Bay has uh, got his hand up. So, Philippe, I've got you unmuted. You're muted on yourself or end as well. If uh, if you want to unmute, then by all means, uh, let's see what we can do. Here we go now. Hi there. Sorry about that. Just a finger problem I had. I I, I raised my hand by mistake. Please oh, no proceed. worries, no worries. Well, <laughs> hey, happy to see you along. Uh, it's been a little while since we spoke, and we'll just carry on then. Yeah, very interesting so far. Keep it, keep it up, guys. Okay, thank you, Philippe. Okay, a, another question. Good quality. You can easily introduce your station to the advertiser because you have the latest digital. That's another good point. There are some markets where where having the latest greatest digital technology is a selling feature even if it's not totally content related but i think it does and and rick i think you can back me up on that it does come back to the content when you get right down to it ultimately but it's nice to have something new and shiny because as this slide shows you've got a world that's changed You've got the whole idea of a table radio being alien to anybody under the age of 40 because they've got smart speakers. Um, That clock radio picture is honest to God, the clock radio I had in college, but we don't use clock radios anymore. We use our smartphones or tablets and all those portable music devices that seem so shiny, new and cutting edge, it's all all in your phone now. So the bottom line is, people are getting their radio in different ways than they used to. Um, The point you made earlier, when you're talking about the ability of a radio station to let people know what they're doing, uh, it used to be back in the day you could depend on word of mouth. But nowadays it can be something as as simple as going to the local newspaper radio TV columnist who starve for information. In smaller markets, the local TV station always has a feature reporter who's looking for something new happening, and HD radio is shiny and new. One of the things that a lot of really smart station operators have done, they bought a couple of the small HD radio table radios, and they're nice because they're small, they're battery operated, but they plug in, so they make a good emergency backup radio. And they'll go into a local advertiser and say, hey, I've got this new channel. It'd be perfect for your three locations of uh, dry cleaning company. And here's a radio so you can get it. Maybe your car already gets HD radio. Uh, they'll, do, they'll, do, they'll do the same with local media people, like the local TV station folks or the local radio TV columnist. And the next thing you know, they've got a ton of free advertising. So one of my, I guess, favorite markets, and uh, the full disclosure, I'm on the WBBA Board of Directors, but uh, Madison, Wisconsin uh, is one of the few markets where if you walk into a store, the store employees will know what an HD receiver is. 
And a lot of that came back to education in the early days, both with uh, WPR, with uh, ECB University of Wisconsin system, and with the local commercial broadcasters. They all did a pretty good job. Now, that market, I don't know about other markets in Wisconsin so much, but, but it does vary very much from one place to another. And education is key. Um, side note, I remember that clock radio that you were talking about every minute, tick, tick, Tick as the well, display kind of, updated. The display was physical, so it flipped. Yep. All right. Um, now, here is probably one of the biggest things we see folks doing when it comes to trying to monetize HD is driving translators. So, I'll talk to that a little bit if you would. I'm going to flip past the gorilla to the next picture. But I'm so pleased with the gorilla. I like it, the gorilla. We all like the gorilla. So, it's real simple. The station updates to HD technology. They light up an HD2 channel. They create new programming. It may be as simple as simulcasting their AM, producing a niche format, going to the local Hispanic or Korean church saying, how would you like to have a 24-hour outlet for all your legacy Bible readings and sermons and so on? They simulcast that HD2 content on an analog translator. Now 100% of the market with an FM radio can get it, either because they have HD and they get it in digital, or because they have an analog FM radio and they get it on the translator frequency. While translators have gotten a lot pricier than they used to be, there's still a lot of them out there. And part of them have to do with the convoluted translator rules the FCC created when they came up with the idea of translators in the early 60s. A translator can be no more than 250 watts. A translator cannot originate programming. It has to rebroadcast existing programming. But there is no height limit for where you put that 250 watt antenna. So if there's some guy with a with a 2,000 foot TV tower in the in the market, you can get halfway to Mars with your antenna and have better coverage than a lot of Class A stations. In addition, there's a lot of religious groups that have what are known as satellites, which are translators that are fed by satellite through a special interpretation of the rules. Part of that limits the power of those to under 50 watts, in most cases, 20 or 30 watts. So you've got a translator that's technically licensed for 250 watts, that's cruising at 20 watts because it's being fed from 500 or 1,000 miles away. Those may be able to be leased from that group and go up to the full 250 watts of power. So there's a bunch of different ways, even if you don't own a translator, you can get access to a translator and fill a need in your marketplace and by all means it's certainly something to if you're in a more congested market talk to a consulting engineer and see what your what your options are um, the funny thing is and uh, I bring this up because we were uh, talking with uh, with Dave Kolasar from WWFD not too long ago about their MA3 project and uh, so they lit up the uh, the AM on MA3 all HD and before they put a translator on it, it was showing up in the ratings. So the receivers are out there probably a lot more than most people suspect. It became a destination format. And, and it's funny because the translator, the translator had been there for a while and they had never shown up in the ratings. The first book in Frederick, Maryland, which is the, the, the metro market that they're, they're technically in, the first book they were all MA3 and could not be received on an analog receiver was the first Nielsen report they showed up in. They showed up in every one since then. And that was a format change for that too, wasn't it? When they went MA3, they, they so part of it comes back to what we were saying before. Content is king. If you're not playing something people want to hear, they're not going to listen. Um, let's see, do we have an FM translator to FM? Joe asked. Uh, so insofar as something that receives an HD signal and rebroadcasts on FM, no, you would do that with a separate HD receiver. But, uh, but certainly, I mean, we and several other people provide low power, uh, low power FM transmitters that could uh, handle a translator. I've got one customer in uh, 
Kansas City running 250 watts. I, they may be derated. I don't think they're derated. I think they're 250 watts at 960 feet. And in Kansas, that uh, that goes out quite a ways. I imagine so, it covers it covers the major population centers of the metro. Well, when we were talking about it at the time, he said, "I'm not sure why I ever built a full power station anywhere," but uh, <laughs> that's one example. So we're running up near the end point. I'm not seeing any. I think I've dealt with all the questions and comments as they've come up. Uh, anybody wants to throw a hand raise up there? This is about the last time you've got to do that. But we do have, of course, as I said, this archive or this uh, webinar and all our other ones are archived. So you can go to our website, website to get those or through our YouTube channel. We do issue the Waves newsletter every two to three months, give or take. I think we just had one not too long ago. So uh, by all means, there's uh, lots of information there. Um, I may be a little biased. There may be a tips article in there that I contribute a little bit to on occasion. And certainly you can go to hdradio.com um, and uh, find more information and uh, contact information. I basically did a screenshot of uh, of the working section of that uh, that website, and uh, that's a good way to get to the folks at Expiry. Um, one little note, and I see it in the top corner. Well, we've got a few seconds left. Uh, Rick, you um, and uh, you guys just finished a merger. We did indeed. We uh, merged with TiVo, which on the surface was kind of a head scratcher for a lot of people. But looking at it big picture, um, Xperia is a company that has a lot of audio patents. TiVo is a company that has a lot of audio patents. The merger of the two firms creates a $3 billion company that has a lot of audio patents. HD radio, just a small portion of that. Mm -hmm. So it's a technology play um, that really benefits everybody. The cool thing about it is, too, it gives you the potential to leverage some cross-purposing from one platform to another. Absolutely. So that's pretty cool. One other question Naveen asks, uh, will HD radio in future support, support additional surround sound modes like 714 and 22.2? Oh, you're an audio guy. I'm an RF guy, so I'm going to let you handle that one. <laughs> well, because uh, Xperia has its own surround sound technologies, um, there's a lot we're looking into. But yeah, down the road, you definitely want to increase the ability for people to enjoy your product and enjoy the capabilities. So that's being investigated. Very cool. Well, on that note, we're just about at the top of the hour, and I try to finish things on time, which is, uh, as my wife would tell you, rare for me in any other aspect of my life, but here, this is what we do. So, Rick, I want to thank you very, very much for spending your uh, part of your day with us. It's uh, It's been a lot of fun. My pleasure. I appreciate the ability to do this. Thank you. Very good time. Now, folks, uh, as I said, this will be archived. You can uh, find it in our webinars. If you're registered for this, you will get an email link shortly in the next day or so once it gets it processed. Thank you very much and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks. Bye-bye.